Hi there, and welcome to Beauty Superstars Talk, your backstage pass to experts in beauty. My name is Mickey Wright, and I'm your host and salon pricing strategist with beautysuperstars.com. I help experienced hairstylists confidently raise their prices and charge what they're worth. And I want to thank you for joining us. So little known fact, I was tall and thin and I had magazines stacked as high as my bed, like all the way around my bed. <laughs> and uh, I dreamed of being a model and that turned into drawing and dabbling into designing and sewing my own clothes as well. And fashion was definitely my first love. And so I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to meet with my next guest who is fresh off of working backstage at the one and only New York Fashion Week. And he's gonna share some of the secrets and all that good stuff that went on there. And um, his name is Julius Toussaint and he was the head of hair and beauty for the Edwin D'Angelo Atelier fashion show. Um, and, you know, it's like, we'll go backstage and kind of get to see what that whole experience was like, you know, working with the, um, the designer, the, um, person who was a producer and art director, and we're looking forward to it. So before we jump in, it's like each and every week um, with Beauty Superstars Talk, I actually have the privilege to interview Black beauty bosses who are doing amazing things in the beauty industry. We give voice to their stories and celebrate their excellence while they drop nuggets to help all of us become better beauty pros as well as better entrepreneurs. And more than a podcast, this is actually a movement to encourage Black excellence, entrepreneurship, to preserve our history, and to bring healing to our industry. So I want to thank our sponsor, which is the Luxury Hairstylist Blueprint, which gives hairstylists a four-step process to raise their prices and elevate their client experience in only six weeks without fear or guilt. So if you'd like to know more, be sure to sign up for the next free webinar, which is at beautysuperstars.com forward slash level up. If you are here for the first time, we want to say welcome. And if you are returning, we say thank you so much. And I want to share with you Julius um, bio. It looks like he has disappeared. We've got technology uh, working against us for a moment. So hopefully he'll be right back. But I do want to share his bio and then we will jump into our conversation if we can get them back. So um, Julius Toussaint, he's hair designer and artist. He's an American artist that specializes in beauty care. It's explained that way because he's so much more than just a hair designer. Hair is Julius' first love, and he started this journey, journey in 1975 in New York City, where other artists like Michael Weeks, James Harris, Demetrius and Anthony DeSantos helped to shape his career. And he's back. If I can just get it to, there we go. There you are. <laughs> I'm just sharing your so, bio. <laughs> can you hear us? Right. And oh, there we go. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yes. And hopefully we're going to keep this down here. <laughs> but I'm back. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Right. And you're just a teensy bit fuzzy, but I, we can see you. So we'll go with that. And I'm just in the Good. midst of sharing your bio with everyone. So um, it looks like in 1977, Floyd Kenyatta spotted him on stage at the New York Cosmetology Show and recruited him to become part of the Fingertips team in Washington, D.C. The move turned out to be a game changer. This opportunity helped Julia see how much more there was to hair other than just standing behind a salon chair. He moved back to New York and opened his first salon and such magazines as Vogue, Essence, and Ebony began to hire him for editorial work. Julius commands attention for his art because he takes hair from the ordinary to create other textures with the aid of shapes. He then turns it into what he calls headgear. He builds wigs, hats, runway gear for fashion shows, as well as documentaries, indie films, and more. My love is my resource. Money is a byproduct product of doing what I love. And so thank you so much for being here. It's like you've had such an illustrious career. And I have to say, it's like we go way back. <laughs> but it seems like it's been about, it feels like about 100 years since we've actually been able to, to really connect. And so I'm really glad that you're here. Yeah. So why don't you start with your, your, you know, where you started in the career, in this career? How did you even get started in beauty? 
Um, I got started in, actually in the military. I was, you know, in the U.S. Army, and um, I understood a little bit about cutting hair before I went in, and I signed up to go into the military. And after I got in, um, just side hustles, you know, and things like that. And I had one person in my command that wanted her hair cut and she wanted to cut so bad. Uh, I was able to convince her by giving her free services. There we go. <laughs> um, free services to cut her hair and I cut her hair and she, she liked it. But when she went back on base, people were asking her, Oh, wow. I like your hair. Where you get your hair cut? And one thing led to another. So I was pretty much without, uh, professional training and all that, you know, doing hair and making a little money on the side. And when I came out, when I when I came out of the military, um, like I told you before, um, my sister, I was sort of hanging out, you know, because I was really young. And um, so I was sort of hanging out, didn't know what to do, uh, because before I went in, I had decided to go to school to be a respiratory therapist. And I realized that was not for me for sure. And so when I came out of the military, I did not want to go back into respiratory therapy, you know, watch all the blood, hitting ER with all that stuff, you know, uh, you know, it's a whole nother world. And so my sister, uh, my oldest sister, which is my second hero to my mother, um, she really got on my case. Like, you, you got to do something, you know, you're bright, you're smart. You know, you dropped out of college, you went in the military, you know, and so she gave me the whole spiel. And so I was like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So she said, well, why don't you, you know, you're cutting hair. So why don't you get into cutting hair? And, you know, back then, the first inclination is barbering, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a guy get into barbering. I did not want to do barbering because I grew up, my father taking me to barbershop and leaving me there and going out going off somewhere with his buddies while I'm there being tortured, you know, <laughs> I did not want to do that. You know what I mean? So um, she said, well, why don't you go to hairdressing school? And my ignorant ass, you know, the first thing I say is, oh, that's for gay people. And so mm -hmm. my sister slapped me inside the head and said, what's wrong with you, you know? And um, so one thing led to another and I started hunting schools out and what have you. And God really blessed me. I ended up at this place called Natural Motions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picked Natural Motions because when I went through the Yellow Pages, it had the biggest advertisement. <laughs> and I said, oh, let me try that place. <laughs> and uh, when I got there, it was an all-white school. And they had never had uh, a person of color or a black person uh, to go to school there. And this gentleman his name is anthony de santos he was the owner and the art director hmm. and he when i when i left because i wasn't sure whether i wanted to go um he ran out on the sidewalk and grabbed me before i could get that off the lock and he said you know are you really serious about you know entering school and i said yeah i really want to do that and right there on the sidewalk he told me he said um well you know, you have a great opportunity. It would be a great opportunity for me because uh, I can receive grants if I begin to take people of color. Well, he used the term minorities, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he said, you will be the first minority uh, entering this school. And if you make the decision to go to school here, I will put you under my wings, personally put you under my wings and show you everything I know. And I was really impressed with him. He was an Italian guy, and I was really impressed with him. And um, I followed him, and he lived up to every single word he said. He taught me razor cutting, pin curling, all that stuff, and not even realizing how special that was at the time that years later, like 10 and 15 years later, you know, I, I was pin curling, razor cutting, and people were in awe of my skill and the only place I got that skill from was from him. Right. You know, so it, it really proved that he really, you know, was gifted in that area. And so that's how I got into it. Beautiful. Yeah. That's, that's, that does have like a God feel that has given me chills just here. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So you were definitely directed to the right place. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know ever since I've known you, it's like you've been doing editorial work and um, you know, photo shoots and doing all kinds of things kind of behind the scenes. How did you get started with that part of the industry? Yeah, well, I got started with that part of the industry um when I was working for this company uh, called Soul Scissors. And it, Soul Scissors was based in New York City, but they had salons. They had 58 salons throughout the world in the United States, in Japan, London. You know, um, you heard of Soul Scissors, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. And um, when I started with Soul Scissors, you know, Art Dyson, who was the founder, yeah. um, he was very inspirational because he got into hair in his uh, late 30s, early 40s. And look what he did, right? I mean, he was right. amazing. God rest his soul. Um, but he had two disciples working for him, um, Michael Weeks and James Harris. Okay. Uh, both of those, um, both of those beautiful people uh, took me under their wings separately. They took me under their wings separately at different times and different periods. Um, but what happened with Michael? Uh, Michael was big in editorial. I mean, he worked for everyone, um, you name it. Uh, L, Vogue, Ebony, Essence. Uh, he was in great demand. He's probably number one. Uh, and that's black or white person. He was number one. Um, he had a way of going on the set and doing work with just his hands and things like that. You know, he was amazing. And But he was also um, one of the directors for Soul Scissors. Mm -hmm. So he was doing double duty, you know, he was working, doing the editorial work, but he was working um, for Soul Scissors as well. And so I was blessed and had the opportunity to work in the same flagship salon with him. Mm -hmm. And so I would see him on a daily basis and he really liked my style. And when I said style, I mean, it, it encompassed everything. It wasn't just, you know, the way I did hair, or when I came to the classes and I was interested in the classes, I continued to be a student of the industry at that time or what have you. And I was pretty young in the industry at that point anyway. Um, but he uh, had a job in California. And mm -hmm. at the same time, Essence was had a shoot for him and he could not do both. So whatever reasons he chose to do the project in California, and he um, told Mickey Goff Taylor, who was the cover editor at the time of Essence, that he had someone to co cover for him while he was there. And so she trusted him. And so she said, hey, yeah, send him out. You know, and we, you know, we still do the shoot. And I went there and I did the shoot. And Mickey Goff Taylor fell in love with me immediately, immediately. <laughs> she liked my style. She liked everything. She liked the way I handled myself around the models. Um, then also this um, gentleman by the name of Ken Barboza, who is a <laughs> top photographer, um, he liked me as well. And so it just took off from there. Yeah, and okay. and, um, and that was really the basis of it. And James Harris came along later and got a lot of work with him and he liked my style as well. Mm -hmm. And he was more of a, of a mentor, a teacher to me more than anything else. And, you know, I learned a lot of things about uh, up dues and how to get work done on stage and things like that through James. And so that translated over into editorial work as, as, as well. Wow. Yeah. Well, you've definitely had a, a storied career and this month actually is called legendary. And it's like, you wow. obviously are a legend, but you've actually had the opportunity and are sharing with us, you know, about working with other legends in the industry. Um, yeah. I actually just interviewed James Harris. So that was definitely a, a delight to sit down with him and get all of the history, you know, um, mm -hmm. kind of poured out on us. So, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know that. That's coincidental, you know. That I'm yeah. <laughs> names and and you and just interviewed him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I tell you something. It's amazing how um, the whole thing, like you said, it comes full circle, and um, you know, a lot of people don't know I've done all this work because okay. I just, I have a little bit of a complex to toot my own horn, you know, and I feel like, you know, talk is cheap, you know, and, and 
good intentions are free. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> action, action speaks louder than anything else, you know? Right, right. Yeah, well, it definitely sounds like, you know, you had the, the preparation, um, you know, how they say what uh, good luck is, you know, preparation mm -hmm. meets the opportunity. And it's mm -hmm. like you were in the right place at the right time. And it sounds like on a day to day basis, doing the right things, you know, interacting with clients, you know, your hair skills, you know, in class, all of those things, I think, are such um, valuable pieces for people listening to to take advantage of and to not say it's like, oh, he was just lucky. It's like, no, <laughs> no. It's a, I mean, again, like you said, the luck or being at the right place at the right time and those things are good. But I think that something that I'm learning through life, and that's a lot of it's outside of this of, of doing hair, outside of fashion, outside of beauty, is understanding how to just be. And you know, that's a very, very important part of achieving success. And, and success when I say success, I'm not talking necessarily monetarily, I'm talking about just peace. And you know, and all those things that encompass success, um, and sometimes it's just when you're just being instead of trying to do, you can go through trials and tribulations. You can go through hardship. You can have experience things that are almost life-ending to bring you around to that revelation, and that you know, peace is the most important thing. And you begin to not try so hard to achieve. And that's when you begin to achieve. I mean, does that yeah. make sense? It does. It does. It's like I want I want you to to take us deeper into you know that just being, and it's like we got a sense of it. But what what does that look like for you, like on a daily basis? You know, as a salon beauty professional, you know, makeup artist, editorial artist, you do all of these different things. So we we you know hear that there's a lot of doing going on, but what does being look like in your world? Uh, being is, I'll tell you a, a story, a, a quick story. Uh, something that I think about my son every single day. I mean, he's very, very special to me. And something in when he was five years old, he's 20, he's, well, he would be 25 actually. But when he was five years old, um, we were out having, I treated him to Chinese food. He really liked Chinese food. And so we're sitting there, just him and I, and we're sitting at a restaurant and we, you know, place the order and they bring the food and they bring chopsticks and they bring forks and spoons as well. And, you know, for people that don't know how to use chopsticks, mm -hmm. I enjoy using the chopsticks because I feel like, you know, you get the full authenticity of eating that type of cuisine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my son, he was five years old at the time. His name is Raymond, Raymond Tassan. He picks up, the he didn't even look at the forks and spoons. He picks up the chopsticks. He goes right to work on that food, man. He's, <laughs> he's used chopsticks better than I do. I've been using chopsticks for decades. <laughs> he's, using, he's only five. He's using chopsticks better than me and just eating. And we're laughing. And I'm saying, Raymond, how did you learn how to chew, use chopsticks? I'm thinking maybe his mother taught him this, you know, because he used <laughs> them so well. I said, how did you learn chopsticks? And he just, like, he has such a beautiful smile. You know, he was just laughing and he and he wouldn't he wasn't really answering me. But because I knew him so well, I could tell that this is something that he picked up from someone and mm -hmm. and, you know, or something. And I couldn't figure it out. And so we finished eating. And he so he finally told me that I, you know, no one told me, no one taught me, no one told me, you know, I just like using the chopsticks. So I, I didn't believe him. Because he was using them so well, I didn't believe him. <laughs> so when I got back to his mother, I asked her, I said, How do you know how to chew? She said, I didn't even know he knew how to use them. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, You should have seen that boy. I mean, he's using shot. So come to find out later on, because after that, the next time, you know, I would pick him up or go to visit or whatever, you know, I go 
with the Chinese food thing because he really liked Chinese food. And so through investigating him, asking him questions and things in a more relaxed form, I realized he just liked Chinese food. He liked the chopsticks. He saw it on TV once mm -hmm. and he just grabbed the chopsticks and started to eat because he was fascinated with the fact that they were two sticks and that you grab that food with it and you <laughs> eat with it. And he even had gotten down the motion because a lot of people eat Chinese food that are not into that culture. They don't realize that the Japanese and the Chinese, when they eat, mm -hmm. they pick up the plate or the bowl as well. It's not just <laughs> you go in and pick it up with the sticks. You pick up the bowl and you meet your mouth with the bowl and the stick. The three are in unison, if you, if you so to speak. And that's how you culturally eat it, right? And <laughs> years later, at that time, because I wasn't really that far into being is, is at that time either. I was more in the doing state as well during that period. That was mm -hmm. you know, 25 years ago. Um, well, no, 20, 21 years ago. And so as I grew, I go back to that period that my son was just being. He was just being. He wasn't trying to do. He wasn't trying to do anything. He was just picking those sticks up and he was using them. You know what I mean? Right. And it's right. like you do, you doing a haircut or you know you know the direction you want to go with it, but you just you get the music on, you get your rhythm, and you <laughs> do your sectioning, and then you just go to town on cutting. You know, and you yeah. just that movement is there. You just being. You're no longer trying to be technical. The technical aspect is there, but it's like. You do it with one brain tied behind your back. <laughs> in order to have that flair and that finish that you want, you just get in a state of being. And mm -hmm. you're no longer doing. You're just being. And you just it's just happening. And the next thing you know, you're finished with that cut. And you're into the blow drying and whatever. <laughs> the tooth part. And you're using your fingers at the end. And you got that one little piece that you texturize on the bang or something and that's right there and that one little piece makes the difference in the whole cut because yeah. you just you're just being you mm -hmm. know what i mean mm -hmm. and it's just like you and not connecting and we're sitting here now talking and it's like everything that's coming up from the past you and i've always gotten along we've never yeah. had one um whatever you call it word you know it's just you are in your state i'm in my state we connect and it's right. you're just being you know, it's just like two people. Um, I've never had that privilege of being in a romantic relationship that way, I guess. But it's the same thing. Two people that really, my mother, or well, my sister, that's a good example. My oldest sister and her late great husband, they were that way. I mean, they just connected, you know, and it's just a rare thing. And so that's more of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Something that you either get it or you don't get it. Mm -hmm. And you have to get to a point that you're not trying so hard anymore. You're not overselling. You're not underselling. You're just in that state. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. And definitely there is um, like a greatness that kind of almost takes over when you're in that space. Amen. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. is, it's just a greatness and that greatness it's not, it can be reserved for one person, a million people, a thousand, mm -hmm. two people, no mm -hmm. one. It can be reserved just for yourself. But when you get there and you're there, you know you're there. Mm -hmm. and, and not to say that you can't be turned around. You can be turned around, but you know there's something special about that feeling and that path right. that you were on. And if you have the wisdom and experience to go along with that, that's when it really clicks. You know, mm -hmm. because yeah. yeah, it's when when it really clicks. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, you know, when you were sharing some of that, it's like a, it came to mind. It's like you know, I used to teach um, the hair portion of the of of our industry. Uh, I used to teach cutting and styling and and coloring as well. But um, with cutting, it's like I would, you know, one of the things that I would say is that you have to listen to the hair. Yes. And people kind of would like what. You know, <laughs> but the no. hair is telling yeah. you where it wants to to, to fall. It's telling it's you true. how much curl it has in it, or wave, or straightness, or whatever it is. It's like it's, it's telling you 
where it wants to be on the head. And yes. so the more you can in, be in tune with what the hair is telling you, the easier your job is because you're not fighting That's with right. the way the hair wants to, to be. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that just kind of came to mind as you were sharing about being, but that's really... Um, it's the same thing, yeah. The yeah. same same, uh, same thing, same concept, but it's just a different platform, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so tell us, I mean, we can kind of hear creativity kind of flowing through you, but tell us, you know, what are kind of the sources of creativity for you? Is it just being in that space and you get ideas or how do you, what is your creative process or has it evolved through the years? Well, it has evolved and there are always one needle and thread that sort of weaves itself through that. Um, uh, one thing I use uh, for a source of creativity when I'm, when I want to be inspired, so to speak, is I definitely use fashion and um, I use Italian Vogue. I've, I've been shopping and picking up Italian Vogue now for like the past 25, 26 years. You know, I, every couple of months, I'll, you know, I pick it up and go through and see what's there to, to inspire me. Um, another uh, source of inspiration for me is photography. Uh, I enjoy photography and you know, and I watch the lighting and things like that. And, and so that's a source of inspiration in terms of, you know, doing the hair. Um, and yeah. So, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so talk to us about fashion week, because we think, you know, fashion week, creativity on all different levels. And so how did you get started with fashion weeks and tell us about last weekend? So <laughs> well, I, I got started with fashion week with Donna Karen, uh, also with uh, James Harris. And, you know, he was the person that introduced me into Fashion Week. Uh, he traveled, you ever heard of Patrick Kelly? Patrick Kelly yeah. was, you know, like one, a giant in fashion. And him and James Harris were personal friends. Um, like I said, James Harris was one of the people that got me involved with Fashion Week and um, originally, and that was wonderful, um, working with him um, and having opportunities to meet um, different designers. And so, um, you know, one thing led to another, uh, working with uh, Floyd Kenyatta. Floyd came into New York when I was doing the cosmetology um, show, uh, and at that time it was in Columbus Circle in New York. It wasn't at the Jacob Javis Center. Oh. Uh, I think that was called the International Beauty and Trade Show. Yeah. And yeah. one of your guests that you had recently, um, the McBride and his yeah. former partner, um, that company was called M&M &M at the uh, time. And yeah. they had hired us as carers and um, platform yeah. artists. And we were working on stage for that company. And Floyd Kenyatta saw me on stage and I had to design all the costumes and outfits for our team. And, uh -huh. and that was including the um, British team and ourselves. And so one thing led to another when Floyd, you know, brought me in and he convinced me and recruited me to come to Silver Springs Merlin and work with fingertips and all that. So all that led into doing fashion week. All that was like encompassed into one thing. And I didn't know that at the time, but giving me the the, uh, the encouragement and and giving me the confidence to get on stage and to talk and to work in front of people, all that, you know, was a, a certain thread that was working there in a positive way. So getting with James, was that was natural because James and I already knew each other from the Soul Sister days, you know? Mm. And so working yeah. with him was fantastic. And then, um, you know, I moved to London. And um, then when I came back, um, you know, I worked with um, a person named Desmond Murray. Mm. And Desmond Murray is a big time editorial person. And so working with him, we worked with um, Japanese Vogue and different mm. you know, magazines and stuff. And came back. 
um, with, uh, with Tassan Salon, and then uh, one thing led to another. I got with um, Nam Campbell and worked with Vogue again, and then of course um, James Harris and and um, and Michael Weeks. They were already into the Fashion Week thing, so I got back into it again with them, and and. You know, I didn't even think about it anymore until after I came back from North Carolina. I had my slot. We're going to pray, pray our way through the rest. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, this has been so good. So it's like we don't want to miss a single word. But um, so tell us about you said you were in New York and then it sounds like you moved back to North Carolina or to North Carolina. And yes, I moved, I moved to North Carolina where my mother was. My mother was. Um, sick at the time oh. and not doing well and so i had just come back from london and she fell ill and so uh, i moved there and well you know that's the bottom line i moved there to take care of her and not even thinking about my career just mm -hmm. to think about my mother my mother right. was my hero and my best friend in the world and um so that I opened a salon there um, okay. and called it Od the Artistry Academy on Main Street in Durham, North Carolina. Okay. You know, it was, yeah, man, really, really great experience. And um, I really enjoyed that. And so what, during that period, it was like 13 years I was there. Oh, wow. And it was successful, very successful with it. Um, really blessed and, um, yeah. So anyway, um, after my mother passing, I decided to move back up north because my all my siblings, except for one, was up here. And, you know, I just had that love for New York anyway, you know. <laughs> and uh, so and, and so I moved back up. And when I moved back, that's when, even though, like I said earlier, I had all that previous experience with James, Michael, um, you know, Donna Karen, different experiences like that. Desmond. Um, however, when I moved back that time, um, that was in 2003, 2003, yeah, 2004. That's when I really, my experience with Fashion Week and doing the runway, that's when it really kicked in because I had a whole different perspective on it then. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, um, or I said in my bio, um, you know, I've never, you know, someone else, and I, I would just quote um, Jay-Z, and Jay-Z was one of the people that I feel just like he feels about it. Money is a byproduct of mm -hmm. what you love to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you should never go into something looking to make a lot of money. You should go into it because you love it. And you are inspired. And when you do it that way and you put your head down and you go full force with it and you continue to be a student of what you love. And that's another mm -hmm. thing we end up doing. Our egos, mm -hmm. our flesh take over and we lose track of what we're doing. That's part of that being that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Being instead of doing. And when you're trying to do, flesh kicks in a lot of times. When you just you are in that being state, you are doing it because you want a good outcome. The good outcome, you can have many, many motives for the good outcome, but you're into it just for that. And when I came back that second time around, I realized that there needs to be a connection with all of it. And so I started a little small agency with an, another person and myself, and um, her name is Heather. You know, and I won't give her a last name because she might not appreciate that. But Heather and I became really good friends and we worked hard together and we built something. And she was a makeup artist end of it and I was a hair end of it. And we, you know, connected our thoughts and our prayers and everything together. And we started something really good and we met a lot of beautiful people. And some of those beautiful people worked with me on the past fashion week. A few weeks ago. Well, I mean, last week. What am I saying? A few weeks ago, right? <laughs> week. It seemed like it was a few weeks. Not even a week. Yeah. Not even a week. Exactly. But last week, some of those same people from now, it's been like, you know, 13 years 
13 mm -hmm. years ago that I met some of these people and they when I call them up and I text them and email them and talk to them about you know I need you your help we we're working for um for a designer a great American designer mm -hmm. and I need your help they dropped all the, everything they were doing and they came out and helped me you know both makeup artists and hairdressers and it's a wonderful thing you know and so um that's sort of like the full circle i know you didn't ask all those questions but i sort of tied it in because this really is tied it tied in together you know what i mean right right yeah, yeah and i i know there's you know people watching that are are like i would love to watch to, to work at fashion week uh, what suggestions or advice might you have for them with you know getting started or preparing for so they're not going in blind or half cocked i guess <laughs> Well, what I would suggest for someone that's just getting into it or want to get into it and don't know how to do it, my number one advice is don't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But no, it's, I, well, well, I say I'm kidding, but in a way, I, you have to really know that you want to do it because you can't get into it looking to make the money. That's mm -hmm. not where your success will be. Your su success is get into it and learn as much as you can about it. Start out as an assistant, you know, backstage. Um, you know, um, for example, I had two assistants um, in this last 2021 fat New York Fashion Week, and they are into it. They got paid, but they weren't there for that reason. They were in there to learn as much as they could possibly learn and both of them are wonderful actually i corey i had never even met corey before and he showed up with kate and kate is a person that works with me on a daily basis mm. and but kate had never done fashion week okay. and so because um i met kate about six or seven months ago and she's been really great working with me in the salon and, and things like that Mm -hmm. and um helping me with assistance and so i asked her would she like to come and help me with fashion week and she's like what can, can i really come I said, of course you can come you know and so she came and she and i checked with her you know last a uh, few days ago and said how did you enjoy it and she's just bubbling over you know <laughs> and, uh, and so and she has the right approach and the right attitude and mm -hmm. she's already in that state she's a she's a young lady she's 19 years old I hope she doesn't mind me giving her, her age, but she's 19 years old and she has so much wisdom. She has that old school wisdom about herself and carries herself in such a ladylike form. But she's yet she's open and she's growing within that. And so the money is going to come and all that's going to come. But she has the right approach to, you know, to doing it. And so that's what I would suggest. And is that get into it that way. Um and then, as you said earlier in the, in the interview, you know, be in the right place at the right time. Uh, have a little bit of luck on your side. You know, and, you know, next thing you know, you, you know, you'll be getting everything you want from it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, um, so actually tell us about last weekend. It's like you had a, a fabulous designer. <laughs> yeah. Um, black african-american and um what is it is he costa rican i'm gonna get it wrong um but tell me his heritage um costa rican yes okay yes. okay so i did get it right okay thank you uh, well, <laughs> you know and the, i believe that's right now i, I want to okay. leave a little bit of room there for <laughs> a mistake i hope i'm not getting that wrong but you know um yeah but he's i'll say this part and I know, and and that this is a good place to start from, rather than trying to get his nationality right. He's a black man, yes. so that is a fact. Okay, <laughs> so he's a black man living in America. Um, he has a beautiful uh, storefront boutique called Style Lab in Harlem, New York. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he, I mean, you, you can, you'll see. Um, his collection, because I'm sure you're going to show or share some of that show with um, mm -hmm. your viewers and the public. And he is magnificent. Um, and his 
he has ready to wear pieces. And that's what really turned me on when um, Curtis Carlton Davis, who's his producer and the art director, had, he got in touch with me because Curtis and I have worked on many projects, um, Munich, uh, different films, things like that. Curtis and I have worked together on. And so he knew that, you know, he could rely on me um, for the mood look, the storyboards and everything of that nature. And uh, so he got in touch with me and asked me if I would be willing to help with the project. And I'm like, of course, you know, I'd do anything for Curtis. He's a great person. Mm -hmm. And um, but not really. I had heard of Edwin D'Angelo. I had heard of him mm -hmm. and I'd seen his work and uh, on different celebrities and things, but I never met him personally. Mm -hmm. And so I had an opportunity to go to the store and check his pieces out. And they were and I was as soon as I saw them on the rack. I mean, it was amazing because he has these things hanging on the rack. You can walk right actually in the store and purchase them and take them home and they're just outstanding beautiful pieces and um so it was you know just natural for me to want to do it and then when i saw the mood board and story pieces that curtis wanted it fit right in with my headgear concept and um so which you will see that on the you know runway too and yep. you know and because that headgear thing, a lot of times people think that, you know, the hair has to be fluffed out and you have to wear the haircut and things like that, which is part of the hair landscape, too. But that's mm -hmm. a whole nother landscape that's headgear, like just a simple ha hat or cap is headgear, you know. Okay. And then as you add on or take away, you can create other dimensions, you know, and mm -hmm. it's part of it's part of fashion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And yeah, so yeah. with, um, with the mood boards, tell us like more about that. What is that? And how does that, um, play with, you know, the hair, the style, the fashion and the whole feel of the show. Cause you've got music, you've got, you know, models, you've got, you know, the, obviously the designs. So how do all of those things tie together? And is it through the mood board and tell us about that sure. aspect? Sure. Um, well, the way the mood board works is, or the way the show, I would say, works, is that it's a concept, an idea that the art director and producer and or will come up with. Mm -hmm. And once they come up with that, they put it on paper like you would do with anything else. They put it on paper. But then that idea, even though it's on paper, it needs to be projected out to the designer mm. and that's the first person on board you know in this case is the designer and that art director and producer has to be on the same page and then once they're on the same page it, it's their baby that need to come to life and so they need to project that out to everyone else including the hair and makeup team and that's where I come in at. Um, in this case, I was the hair and beauty lead. And so he, when he, when Curtis got in touch with me, um, he shared the mood board with me. And not only the mood board, but the storyboard as well. He shared both of them with me. The storyboard is more of a theme that's written down and that theme comes to life. All right. But it's written in a story form. So mm. he shared that with me. So the models would know how to project, you know, the walk and how they would project the pieces when they go out onto the runway and also the mood board. Now the mood board, no one sees that except the hair and beauty team and yeah. the designer themselves or designer himself. And so he shared that we had a discussion with that. We met one-on-one -on -one and discussed all those ideas. He wanted to get some of my input so we can make it really come to life on how we could do the headgear and those type of things. Once that was completed, then I formed my team, my okay. hair and makeup team. Okay. And when I formed that, they they really don't care about that part of it. And if they do, they will share it with me and we'll work it out. But that's not really their job. Their lane is just to come in 
and apply the makeup and create that look that we need apply the hair and what are we going to do with the headgear and yep. um, and so we come up with looks you know and again that's where when you asked me earlier on about where i get some of my inspiration and through the italian vogue you know you go into the italian vogue you see you see eye colors you see lips you see you know different things like that with makeup yeah i might get inspiration for headgear or something from there and maybe just one little piece like in this last show we did we did leather straps around the head and we tied the leather strap we made built ponytails and tied the leather straps over laying crisscrossing the leather straps down the ponytail adding hair making the hair long going all the way down to the waist some of them weren't all the way to the waist some were it didn't matter but we tied we crisscrossed those leather straps down so we connected it from around the head um onto the ponytail down to the end it was really really amazing and so that may be um just one piece i may see something that's tied around the forehead mm -hmm. and that's all that that's enough for me to right. inspire me to do the rest right you know? okay. and so that's how the mood board comes up so at the bottom line with the mood board that mood board has to be sent out to everyone else on the team so they can we all can be on the same page the day of the show okay yeah okay yeah so the day of the show it's like we were hoping to be able to go backstage with you live and it sounds like it just couldn't happen it's like it got a little too uh i don't know if hectic is the word but but tell us what it was like being behind backstage because hopefully yeah, we well being behind it it was just a little we were just i think you and i we were a little bit too inspired we <laughs> thought we could pull that off but man went when the show started even though it was controlled chaos and we were definitely was not crazy back so as a matter of fact it was one of the more well run shows that i've ever been a part of it was okay. beautiful it you know people weren't acting crazy and running around like you know a chicken with the head cut off it was very very organized which was great however with that being said it's still time was our enemy you know and so in order to start the show on time for example on the mood board what comes along with the mood board is what you call a call sheet and call times the okay. call sheets have everyone's names email and phone numbers on it and what position they um they hold whether it's makeup artist hairdresser head makeup artist um lead hair and beauty and hair or whatever but you also have what you call call times and the mm -hmm. call times are broken down and to what time the models arrive, what time the hairdressers arrive, what time the makeup artists arrive, what time we start, and what time you have to be finished, and what time the show starts. Well, unbeknowing to the rest of the oh, no. show time <laughs> six o'clock. But Curtis and I knew that the show time was actually seven o'clock. So okay being that it was six o'clock that was listed everybody was finished at six so we were able to do the lineup the lineup was perfect and everything and so by the time seven o'clock got there everything was completed and showtime was ready and there was no you know body running late or anything because we were working at six o'clock even though the show was actually started at seven and you yeah. actually have to do that you have to get into the whole mindset of a different time, it, you know, because that's how we do everything. As hairdressers, that's what, that's what we do. We we put we have a 15 minute grace period, you know, to sleep up, to get ready, to clean your tools, you know, and get ready for the next client, you know, because if you put it right there on that spot, then you're gonna run late for someone. You know, right. the person can be running late. I mean, we're talking about in salon situation, but it's the same thing with doing a show you have to actually have that time allotted so you can run on time and so right. that's somehow the um the whole show lineup thing goes you know with that with the mood board yeah yeah and so yeah it was well, nice that, it was very that's nice. really cool to hear you know the the process and everything going on backstage and and 
definitely the time. It's like I've I've been part of photo shoots and and shows and that type of thing. And it's like you start super early, and you know, there's always someone that's like, why do we have to start this early? The show's not till you know whatever time. And it's like it goes so fast. It's like a blink. Mm -hmm. You want to share about Fashion Week or about your career? What I was saying is that I. You said I want to do. I want to add anything, and one of the things I like to add is how you know new evolutions cosmetics supplied all of that makeup for. We had thirty um, girls and we had ten boys, forty models all together. Wow! And that's a lot of people. And that's a lot of makeup. Right. And and some of them we had applied twice. And mm. they they and they supplied that free of charge in sponsorship, part of the sponsorship for the show. That that's wonderful to do, a wonderful thing to do. And they have an all natural line of makeup, which is rare in itself. And mm. um, okay. they're committed to using vegan products in their makeup, but you know they're able to really give the matte finishes, and you know. You know, everything that you would normally get from a line that has a lot of synthetic ingredients in it. And theirs don't, their line does not have synthetic ingredients in it. I also want to give um, credit to Tracy Anderson of Noxit Studios. Tracy Anderson is a wonderful And um, he came, he, we worked together a lot. He came and did all the backstage work and the video that you will see that was on the runway that you, you're going to share that was done by Tracy Anderson. And so okay. I want to give that credit to them as well as my team, you know, the hair and the makeup team. Um, awesome. Sharon Alexander, Carmen Virginia Brown, um, Kelly, uh, Kelly, um, Susan, um, Daniel Wright, um, Byron, uh, you know, all of them, everyone that was there to help, um, Kate, Corey, you know, the whole team, you know, they, you know, really great. And I really appreciate mm. them so much. Nice. Yeah. Well, congratulations on a great show. And I'm so glad that we got this opportunity to talk. It's Thank like you. our technology is not trying to, to play good with us. <laughs> But, um, yeah. but it looks like we're making it through. It was rough tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah but um, absolutely wonderful. So I, I appreciate, and I appreciate you too. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you're you. doing wonderful things too, Mickey. You really are. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. And, um, and I hope that, uh, that we can tune in and, and check this out soon, yes? Yes, yes, that is the, the plan. It looks like we'll need to do some editing. So <laughs> we'll try to get it turned around ASAP. And um, any words of wisdom um, from your past? I know you work with such legendary artists. I know I think we met through Thomas Hayden um, with the National Hair Fashion Group. And um, so any words of wisdom that have been God given? Rest soul, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think that the words of wisdom is what I've always said and always done. And that is continue to be a student of the industry. Do not, do not completely grow up. Continue <laughs> to grow and leave room for growth and always look to learn. You know, I mean, that, the best hairdressers are always learning. The best hairdressers are always learning. When you get to the point you think you know everything, you know, mm -hmm. and one of the things I picked up, I'm picking up martial arts through um, my friends that and, and family members that are into deep into martial arts. And that's one of the things that you learn in martial arts is that you have to be a student in order to continue to grow and be better, at, you know, a better person, better wow. at um, dealing with people, 
It sometimes is not even about the hair. Sometimes it's about customer relationships. You know what I mean? Um, right. Like one of the things that you are offering now is understanding your pricing. I mean, those things are part of the industry. You know, you can't, you know, you just have to encompass everything. Photography, understanding what lighting is about. Um, don't think that it's just all behind the chair, you know. Um, get mm -hmm. into all aspects of it. Um, I mean, someone is talking about I'm bored with hair. They haven't even scratched the surface. Right. I've been in this thing for over 30 years now, you know, approaching 40. <laughs> and, man, let me tell you something. You know, you we can learn. We can always learn. So just continue right. to be a student and don't, don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to set the ego aside. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. of that. Try. I think Amen. Um, so important what you just said. So thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm, I'm grateful for our time together and grateful you've been able to share so much. So I hope everybody's been taking notes and definitely drop you know something a nugget that you got out of this uh this conversation in the comments it's like if you're watching us on youtube you know be sure to subscribe there it's like you can also view um this as well as uh, almost 70 other interviews that i've done um on beautysuperstars.com forward slash podcast and we invite you you know it's like if you like to be part of our part of our organization i guess you could say partner with us um you can visit beautysuperstars.com and just look for the red button. It's like to be able to further the work that we're doing. And we invite you to tune in for next time. And of course, you know, it's like, if you are struggling with your pricing, like Julius mentioned, uh, it's like, I totally get it. So <laughs> I want to invite you to the next um, Level Up and Charge What You're Worth um, free webinar. And you can register um, and be part of that next group. Um, it is at beautysuperstars.com forward slash uh, level up. Beauty superstars with an S on the end dot com forward slash Amen. level up. So um, we um, appreciate you being here. Appreciate you watching. Please, um, you know, follow us and share this with a, a friend or colleague that may get something out of this or someone who may want to, you know, dive into that world of working at Fashion Week. And so thank you so much julius yeah. appreciate you appreciate you being here and taking time out of your schedule to join us and share this um, um, amazing career that you're you're having <laughs> so all the best and thank uh, you, everyone. keep reaching for the stars and we'll see you next time <laughs>